this story is about one of the most horrible sights that a quiet town like Davis ever saw. For all of you that don't know, Davis is a small safe college town in California. It was also named one of the best places to live in the state, that being one of the reasons why Claudia Maupin moved there. But in April 2013, the residents of Davis would be hit by terrible news. No one saw it coming, and the fact that one of the safest towns in the state would succumb to such terror made everyone feel afraid for their lives. Welcome to Fear Files, where we discuss and dissect the most mysterious, terrifying and mind-bending cases from all over the world. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you're a fan of our work. Also, hit that bell icon so you can be notified each time we post a chilling story. Before we start, we would like to say that our thoughts and prayers go towards Claudia Morpin and Oliver Northup's families. Welcome to Davis, California. The city, founded in 1868, was named Davisville for Jerome C. Davis, who owned a stock farm on the site. The city's name was shortened in 1907 by the post office and became the official name in 1917. In 1905, the University of California acquired 778 acres, that's 315 hectares, in the locality for a branch campus opened in 1908 and an experimental farm school, which is now the College of Agricultural and Environmental Sciences. Subsequently, schools of veterinary medicine, letters and science, engineering, law, medicine, biological science, management and education were established. The Davis campus of the University of California now covers more than 5,000 acres. The importance of being a college town ties into this story. Claudia was 67 years old at the time of the tragedy. She was a beloved grandmother and her two biggest interests were the local theatre as well as being active in the Unitarian Church and Davis. Claudia loved living in college communities. She enjoyed being around young people. This would fill her up with energy and bring a smile to her face. Another reason why she moved there was to find love again. Being divorced twice, she was looking for her true soulmate. And of course she found him. Where other than the local church? For the entirety of her life she had been a spiritual traveller, experiencing different religions, which all led to her falling in love with the Unitarian Church. Thus she knew deep inside that her next husband would be a member there. Claudia soon met Oliver, or Chip, Northup, who had also been married several times, and the two families instantly clicked. Claudia had that ability to make every person that she spent time with feel so special that people would consider her their best friend. Oliver Northup, also known as Chip, was 11 years older than Claudia. He was 87 at the time when the disaster struck. Oliver, an attorney, talented musician and a founder of the local church, met Claudia while both being active members of the church. He was also a World War II veteran which made him that much more respected and loved in the community. Both sides of the family were thrilled when the two lovebirds decided to get married in 1996. It was the happiest day of their lives. It was obvious that the two were madly in love. They finally felt like they found the person with who they were supposed to be with for the rest of their lives. And they also gave the impression of having the perfect relationship. Everyone loved them. And the church at the time of their wedding was full to the brim with friends and family. But who would have thought that the two were about to be the victims of a horrific crime? They lived in Davis, after all, one of the safest places out there. On the night of Saturday, April the 13th, 2013, the couple say goodnight to each other for the very last time. The next morning, Claudia and Chip were expected at church but in a strange twist of events, they didn't arrive. This fact made their family members wary. They were members that were so involved in their local church that it had to be a very good reason for the couple to miss the morning service. Chip's daughter even called the couple on their cell phones, but both calls went to voicemail. The family just thought that they preferred to sleep in, so they didn't worry too much. 
but Chip was a member of the local folk band, and when he didn't show up for a gig that afternoon, his son Robert decided to pay him a visit at his condo. He rang the doorbell with no response. Robert waited for a bit, but wasn't greeted by anyone. From what he saw, all signs pointed to the couple going on a vacation, just the two of them. Robert even had a key to the condo, but because he wanted to respect their privacy, he did not use it. He just turned around and went the other way, not wanting to pry on what the happy couple were up to. When evening came, Laura, Claudia's stepdaughter, decided to go back to their condo because nobody had heard anything from them for some time. She arrived at their front door and rang the doorbell. After waiting a couple of minutes with no response, her first instinct was to go around the back and see what was going on. She climbed down the stairs and started walking, all the while looking at the windows to see if anyone was home. Upon reaching the other side of the building, she noticed that a window was open and the screen appeared to have been slashed. Laura immediately had a strong feeling in her stomach. She just knew that something was terribly wrong. Upon looking inside the condo, the woman saw a terrifying sight, an image that she will not forget for the rest of her life. Blood stains were all around the living room, turning their couch, carpet and furniture almost completely red. That image was enough to make her call the police and the family members. Later, the family members found out what exactly had happened that led to the death of the beloved couple. Upon investigation, Claudia and Chip had been stabbed multiple times, dying in a pool of their own blood. The coroner told the family members that Chip had 61 stab wounds and that Claudia had been stabbed 67 times. It was a case that went completely against everything the small college town stood for. They were mortified. They couldn't understand how anybody had the strength to even do that. And another question popped into their minds. Why would anyone do it? A total of 128 stab wounds made Chip and Claudia's family members, along with their friends, ask so many questions. The murders didn't make sense to any member of the community. That's the day they all realised that a cold-hearted killer was on the loose, and each member of the community, even if they didn't say it, thought about who could be next. But now comes the most terrifying part. Police Lieutenant Paul Doroshov stated that the killer did some experiments with the two bodies of the elderly couple. A cell phone was placed inside Claudia's abdomen, and in Chip's stomach, a drinking glass was found. Lieutenant Paul Doroshov of the Davis Police Department thought that maybe these sick and twisted experiments would lead to something. Maybe there would be some sort of clues in trying to find out who the killer was. But unfortunately, the investigators were without a lead while trying to crack the code. If only there was a code to crack. The place wasn't even ransacked. There were no valuables missing. There wasn't a trace of a burglary or even signs of an attempt. 25 FBI agents immediately came and flooded the neighbourhood, trying to obtain as much information as they could, but to no avail. As it turned out, it seemed like it was the perfect crime. No footprints, no fingerprints, nothing. Even the FBI profilers were out of ideas. They didn't know if they were dealing with one killer or more. The case became more and more complicated. Each time they asked a question, two others popped up. Their first thought was that it had to be someone close to Chip and Claudia. It was the most logical theory. Maybe it was all caused by a family dispute or even a disagreement. All signs pointed to it being personal. The agents developed a story that someone with a key had done it, and that the cut in the screen door was created only to take away attention from what had really happened. This theory led to suspecting family members, and soon thereafter all of them were called individually for questioning. Then, the police investigation went into the direction of Chip's son, Robert, and his own two sons, Oliver and Tony. Oliver also suffered from schizophrenia. The police also knew that Robert had a key to the couple's condo. Upon being asked if he knew that the police were looking at him and his brother, Oliver Northup said that they did, and that all of them agreed to cooperate. They didn't have anything to hide. The first day of questioning took eight hours, and the next day was summed up in six. The three family members, Robert and his two sons, were exhausted, but he knew deep down that Chip would want them to be as helpful as possible. The father and two sons were questioned without a lawyer present. 
Robert knew that neither him nor his sons had anything to do with this, but of course the two boys were nervous during the interrogation. And how could they be calm? Upon looking through Robert's things, the police found carpeting that had been steam cleaned on the day of the murders. Investigators also found a very disturbing drawing made by Tony. It was a man holding a knife over two children in a bed. This kind of evidence would make anyone nervous and could easily be linked with the murder. But Robert stated that it was just bad timing. He didn't know that the day his father would be murdered would be the same day he cleaned his carpets. Mary Northup took the side of the three. She told the police that they weren't violent and that Chip would spend all the time he had with his two grandsons. No one in the family thought it was possible for either one of them to murder Chip and Claudia, and they all stuck together. Robert's family spent thousands of dollars hiring an attorney for Tony and repairing all of the damage done by the investigators. The Northup family, especially Tony, felt persecuted for no reason. When their carpet had been cut out by the police to perform further tests on it, and when some of the plumbing fixtures were taken out, in hopes of finding anything hidden in the drain, the man and his two sons felt like they wanted to hide their heads in the sand. But even though his name was eventually cleared, Tony still felt that neighbours had their doubts about him. Three years after the murders, he would commit suicide. Oliver got a tattoo in memory of him. But everything changed one evening. For the entirety of two months, police thought the murder was perfectly executed. But that was about to change. One evening, the police received the following phone call. The caller requested to remain anonymous, but later it was found that his name was Alvaro Garibe. What are you reporting? Double homicide. He was a 17-year-old Davis High School student, and he claimed that the killer was his best friend. This information baffled the police, and it immediately captured their attention. When this tip came in, it seemed really strange. It didn't seem to match what any of the investigators had thought. Upon hearing the name of the murdered, Jeff Rising, a Yolo Country DA, recognised it immediately. He knew it from a couple of years back, but it wasn't associated with any crimes. As it turned out, Dan Marsh was viewed as a young hero, saving his father's life. At age 10, Daniel received the American Red Cross Heroes Award after using CPR to save his father from a heart attack. Hero to accused teen killer, video of then 12-year-old Daniel Marsh from 2009 when he was honored for saving his dad's life. And tonight, that 16-year-old is facing double murder charges for killing an elderly couple inside their Davis home. The DA even thought to himself at the time that Daniel Marsh was going places. He was shocked when he heard that someone accused the 15-year-old of being a killer, especially after what he did five years prior to that. No one imagined that the depraved killer of Chip Northup and his wife Claudia might turn out to be a 15-year-old teenager, and certainly not a teenager that was once considered a hero. When the murders took place, Bill Marsh lived next door to the victims, but his son Daniel lived with his mother in walking distance of his father's house. At the time when the bodies were discovered, Bill was recovering at home from back surgery. The police knocked on his door, asking people around the block if they knew anything. This was happening right after the bodies were found, but Bill Marsh said that he didn't know them and that he'd just moved in. After two weeks from when the murders happened, Bill Marsh moved out, saying he couldn't afford the rent anymore. Special agent Chris Campion said that he remembers clearly that one of the neighbours came up to him and pointed out the suspicious way Bill Marsh moved out right after the murders. He didn't think much about it at the time. And investigators might never have focused on Daniel Marsh if not for that phone call from 17-year-old Alvaro Girabe two months after the crime, accusing his best friend of murder. His friend revealed that Dan always talked about killing people but his best friend never took him seriously. Investigators were surprised that he knew so many details about the murder, details that would only be available to the investigators and the killer. The boy was interviewed two times and a thought went through the investigators' minds. What if he is the killer? Alvaro Garabe told the investigators exactly what happened. He said that his friend wanted to see Chip and Claudia's insides. Also, he wanted to know what an eye looked like, 
so he tried taking it out with a knife, but it turned out that it was too hard and he gave it up. When asked why he didn't notify the authorities earlier, the young student said that he was scared for his and his family's lives. Dan Marsh threatened to kill again. In the summer of 2013, more specifically on June the 17th, Daniel Marsh was called for questioning, but he was more than happy to help. It was now up to Ariel Pineda, a Davis detective, and Special Agent Chris Campion to find out who really did it. The troubled teen was calm during the interrogation. At first, anyway. He thought that he would talk his way through it and nothing would happen. Upon being questioned, Dan Marsh said that he didn't know anything about it. He only knew what everyone else did. The fact that someone broke in and killed Chip and Claudia. Investigators would spend the next three hours learning all they could about Marsh, looking for a way in. Daniel told them that he was always a loner and was considered an outcast. On the computer, do research on psychopaths. Yeah. Why did you do that? I looked up sociopaths and psychopaths because I always found it fascinating and the more I've aged, the more I can relate because I don't feel so. His parents split up when he was younger, and that affected him very much. His mum left his father and had an affair with a different woman for about three or four months, and that woman was Daniel's own kindergarten teacher. Upon speaking with his best friend, they already knew the fact that Daniel hated this woman and held her responsible for their parents' divorce. Also, he would tell Alvaro that he'd like to strangle her to death. Marsh had this massive amount of built-up anger. He even tried to take it out on himself. While answering the investigators' questions, he said that he used to hurt himself, pointing to his left forearms where a couple of scars could be visible. The 15-year-old was willing to do anything to feel something, including starving himself. Daniel was voluntarily committed to a disorder clinic for 25 days to cure his eating disorder. But while his anorexia went away, his anger still consumed him. It was later revealed by his friend that Daniel also tried to commit suicide, about four times when he was 14 years old. Several therapists and doctors tried to help him. Then in December 2012, Daniel all of a sudden said to a school counsellor that he dreamed about killing other people. She was scared and called the police. Daniel was shortly hospitalised, but upon release, things took a turn for the worse. But in his police interview, Daniel was denying it all, including the murders of Claudia and Chip. Then, after three hours and 38 minutes of questioning, he started to take off his mask. Upon being asked why he is lying to Special Agent Chris Campion, he responded that he would do anything to protect himself. He didn't want to go to jail and be arrested for two murders. He also admitted that he was scared, and since that statement, the investigators knew that they had him. Marsh requested to be sent to a psychiatric hospital, and what he said next left the investigators speechless. He told them that every time he looks at someone, in his mind he sees flashes of images of him killing that person. It was clear now. Daniel Marsh was disturbed. He was a danger to himself and others, and he was fascinated with murder. When asked by the agent how Daniel would kill him, the 15-year-old quickly replied. He said that he could think of a lot of ways, one of them being choking him with his own tie, or another method implied beating his face into the mirror until it broke, then using the broken glass to cut out his arteries and gouging his eyes out just before smashing his face into the wall. Then, looking him in the eyes, Daniel finished by saying that it's nothing personal. Upon further investigations, it was confirmed that Daniel was mentally sane, even though he later pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity. After finding him sane, the jury found him guilty of two counts of first-degree murder, along with enhancements for the use of a lethal weapon, killing several people, lying in wait and torturing the victims. 
For each murder count, he received a sentence of 25 years to life in prison, plus an additional two years for the enhancements to the crime. But it didn't end there. Proposition 57 was passed in California in 2016 and allows the juvenile court to decide whether or not an incident involving a minor should be brought before an adult court. As a result, Daniel's case had to be re-examined because the legislation might be applied retrospectively. Accordingly, a court in October of the same year ordered Daniel to serve the balance of his time in prison. Currently, he's serving time at the Richard J. Donovan Correctional Facility in San Diego, California, according to available data. In June 2037, he will be able to apply for parole for the first time. Another statute, known as SB 1391, which prohibits adolescents from being prosecuted as adults under any circumstances, was affirmed by the California Supreme Court in February 2021. As a result, Daniel has a chance of being let out of prison sooner rather than later. A hero turned villain. This was the tragic story of Claudia Maupin and Oliver Chip Northup's brutal deaths caused by the hands of an unlikely murderer. A 15-year-old who five years prior saved a life instead of taking it. If you enjoyed this story, don't forget to like the video, comment down below with your take on it, and subscribe to the channel. Also, hit that notification bell in order to stay up to date each time we reveal a new shocking case. And until next time, stay safe and keep your eyes peeled. You never know what's lurking in the shadows. <laughs>